There are people listening right now, I know, who so desperately want to step into what's next for themselves and in their lives, but they feel trapped literally by their community. Mm -hmm. How do you navigate that? You have to just put it aside. You have to start thinking with, and, and I'm, I feel so blessed to have chosen to fall in love with and marry somebody who is 25 years older than me, because what it does for me is put into perspective how short life is. And I tell Brandon this all the time. It's not his favorite topic, but like, I only have a finite amount of time with him. And knowing that I only have a finite amount of time with him, I want to make the most out of that time. But then I also, it makes me remember like, wait a second, I also have a finite amount of time here. And so this idea of death and having death around me, not that Brandon's dying anytime soon. This is the part that Brandon doesn't love so much, but like this idea and this kind, kind of, kind of constant like just thing that's in my life with him and, and our age difference really does put into that perspective that I don't want to be 85 years old and be stuck around the same people that I was stuck around and to be talking about the same things and to have not really gone after it. And I do believe for anybody who's listening to this right now, a lot of people have those feelings, but you have that moment, you watch a movie that's inspiring or you go listen to a podcast and then you get back into your normal environment and you don't take the action to make the change. And so I like to think of it in, in the reverse of like, how do I make this experience so painful for myself? How do I really live in, oh my God, Natalie, what if you were in Brandon's shadow the rest of your life because you never figured out how to publicly speak because you were so embarrassed and insecure? Like what, imagine being, 85 year old you and and feeling this way and all of a sudden as soon as i think of 85 year old natalie i'm like she is not going to feel this way she's i'm going to conquer whatever i need to conquer now in order to not have to show up as that person in this lifetime and death for me is a is a significant motivator uh more so than the opportunity you're like what a glamorous awesome life could look like right now because that oftentimes doesn't actually force the behavior change that, that's such a great point. And I've often said, if you can change your relationship with the death and time, you will mm. change the way that you operate in the world because yep. assuredly it's fucking coming, whether you like it or not. And yep. one of my people ask me all the time, what is my fear? I literally only have one fear in my life. And that is that I will die with regret and anything mm. shy of that. Like I'm fucking jumping off the diving board. Now, I will say this, it took like rock bottom to be able to get to that place to even be able to say that. What was your journey being able to step into this mindset? Because I'm going to guess, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, that this is not where you started. No, it's totally not where I started. I was so insecure for so long. And in my story, you know, sometimes you look at people and you think, man, they were born like that. I look at my my husband or I look at people like Grant Cardone and it's like, they must have come out of the womb and just been able to be charismatic and energetic. And I had none of those skill sets. And so I really felt very introverted being around people like that. And I told myself that story for the longest time until it really clicked for me. I was sitting at a 10X growth conference back in 2019 and a guy by the name of Pete Vargas went on stage and was talking about how you need to be able to share your message and your story in order to make an impact. And that message at that point in time really pivoted my mindset around how selfish I was being by allowing myself to become so introverted that I wasn't able to help other people. And at the time I was more focused on helping other women, specifically in age gap relationships, because it's a difficult thing to navigate and not a lot of people talk about the challenges because it does seem like it's something that comes from privilege, um, but really what happens is you get lost in yourself. So I had worked with Brandon for many years before and I had this business skill set, but this thing that was really plaguing me was the insecurity around the relationship. And this idea of 85 year old Natalie dying on her deathbed, still being introverted and having lived in Brandon's shadow for the rest of my life was the, the real catalyst for me to say, okay, I'm gonna own my story. I'm gonna learn how to communicate with other people. I'm gonna do the things that I need to do to get confident in myself. I'm going to work out every day. I'm going to wake up early. I'm going to read books. I'm going to become that person. And that catalyst moment happened to be at the exact same time that we met our future business partners who allowed us to, you know, join for forces with them and start connecting with their audience, which also gave me the encouragement being around 
the same type of like-minded people who are the 10Xers and their growth and their stories kind of fueled me and propelled me to just continue with it and not give up. There, I think there's so much space in which we make that declaration to ourselves, right? I'm going to do that thing. I'm going to show mm. up. I'm going to wake up early. I'm going to execute. Was it literally a 180 for you? Because for me, it was a struggle. Like I go look at from 26 to 29, these three years of my life were uh -huh. so fucking difficult because it was like uh -huh. one step forward, 8 million steps backwards. Yeah. And I, I, I think people often get caught up in this idea of like, oh yeah, they just made a decision and everything was different. Mm -hmm. I love that you talk about this and ask this. This is such a great question because I've never been asked this question before, but no, it wasn't one decision where all of a sudden there was this 180. Uh, in 2019, I made the decision that I was going to start public speaking, that I was going to get a speaking coach, that I was going to go through courses around my story. So the, the journey really started in 2019, in, in January of that year, working out three times a week was, was the original target. And then the the real catalyst for me was actually COVID. And I'll never forget when the whole world shut down and I heard Grant Cardone on a webinar telling people that now is the time to get your discipline in. It is not the time to sit on the couch. It is not the time to drink excessively. It's not the time to just panic and freeze. Now is the time to reinforce and really implement those things so that you have confidence during a time when everybody else has likely lost their confidence. And so going into COVID and quarantine, I moved, I, everything changed for me then. I moved from going to bed at like midnight most nights, waking up a little bit later to, I was in bed every single night by 9.30. I worked out every single day. I did Cardone University trainings every single day. I entirely changed my diet. Uh, and that, that one and a half month span that we were in quarantine in the Pacific Northwest, entirely changed the trajectory of the past two years because it gave me the discipline that I needed. And it was that that was like to me the biggest pivot. But now those things are routines and habits that I can't imagine living life without because I know how strong it made me. But no, it was initially this constant battle for about a year and a half of one step forward, maybe not 8 million steps backwards, but maybe like three or four steps backwards and then feeling a lack of confidence in myself. Hey, what's up Unbroken Nation? We'll be right back to today's episode, but I wanna take a moment and invite you to Think Unbroken Conference. That's right, our next conference is happening right around the corner this December with amazing speakers from around the world who are leaders in personal development, trauma education, mindset, and more. All you have to do to register to watch for free, that's right, zero dollars, come and join us, is go to myunbrokenlife.com, register and sign up, you can get access to to the free event, watch it live with us this December. It'll be myself speaking along with amazing human beings like Anthony Trucks, Jamie Bronstein, Leslie Logan, and a special interview that I'm doing with Dr. Gabor Mate that has never before been released. So come and join us, myunbrokenlife.com. All you have to do is put in your email. We'll send you over the registration. You'll be able to come and join us, watch live. And then if you want access to the recordings or more information there for you to keep them forever. But in the meantime, go sign up. Up, block it off on your calendar. This is going to be a transformational experience that you do not want to miss. Head over to myunbrokenlife.com to register for free. And until next time, be unbroken. And what I'm thinking as you're going through this is the word resiliency keeps coming to mind. And talk, talk about that. Where does resiliency play a role in this? Yeah. So that's why I wrote a chapter about resilience in my book. Um, and I talk about how it can't be, um, you can't actually give, I can't give you Michael resilience and you can't give me resilience. You can build resilience. Um, some people are born with more resilience than others. Some people just have a, a different outlook and that goes back to neuroscience and genetics and all kinds of, you know, things, environment, everything that, that, that turns us into who we are as human beings. Um, but resilience is the, is the ability to kind of keep getting back up with, with a no, with one no or 10 no's or 500 no's. The, the ability to say, you know what, that might still be a no, but I'm not going to quit until I get the yes. Um, Jack Canfield, you know, all those chicken soup with soul books. I don't know if you know them or read them, read them years ago. And he was um, told no by hundred and I think it's 137 publishers. 
Um, and someone asked him one day, you know, well, why didn't you quit at like one, one twelve or 57 or 82 would know like, why don't you just stop and you couldn't get your book published? He said, because I didn't get the yes I wanted. He kept going and going and going and trying different things to get his book published. And finally someone on a plane after it happens read his book on the way home and said, yes, we'll publish it. And that was number 138. But if he had stopped anywhere before then, this, that, that series, I think it's like the best selling series of all time or something like that. Um, but the whole point is when someone asked him, why didn't you quit? I didn't have what I wanted yet. I didn't have what I wanted yet. So if you quit, you're never going to get what you want. If you keep going, it might take you longer. You might have to keep hearing no's like you were saying a million times and, and it doesn't feel good, but it doesn't mean you're still not going to get it. You're definitely not going to get it if you quit. Yeah, for sure. You're not. And, and you mentioned building resiliency. Like what is that process? How do you do that? So I say it, I say you build resilience by not being around people that are negative. Um, you keep looking for other solutions. So you're told no for a job. Well, then you're going to go to someone else that might tell you yes. Um, you are told no for a raise or promotion, then you're going to ask what you can do to have it next time. Um, you keep going to someone else or something else to find your solution or find the thing you want. And you don't take, basically you're, you're taking no for an answer because that might be the answer, but that's not the answer forever. And building resilience is continuing to go back to the things that you know are true or that or whatever you're really, really fighting for and looking for. And saying, I'm not giving up. I'm going to find another resource that's going to help me. So it's, it's asking more questions, building resilience. It's going to different resources. It's talking to new people that will be able to support you. It's looking for anything and anyone that's going to help you get where you want to go. And I don't mean this in a selfish way. Like, what can you do for me? It's just, here's what I'm look, looking for. Is there anyone that has any guidance or insight for me? It's not a, it's just, a, Hey, I'm wondering if that's what, that's what happened when I published my book. I. I, I was, I had it almost fully written and I needed a publisher and I needed a book cover and I needed, I didn't even know what I needed because I'd never done it before, but I sent an email to like, I think 20 people in the business world that I knew, um, would support me and I supported them. And I just said, you guys, I need these five things. Do you guys know anyone that can help me with these? I'm willing to pay for them. I'm willing to do the work. I just, I know what I need, but I don't, I can't go to one person for this. I know it's probably three or four different things. And all these people started replying to me and saying, I can help you with this. Hey, check out this resource. Hey, uh, there's a book uh, on this. Hey, I know this person that does this. And all of a sudden I had all my answers. I didn't, I didn't have them all here. I didn't know them. I, I did. I was, I was smart enough to know that I couldn't do that on my own. So I asked people that supported me in my network, how I can make it happen. And if all of them came back with zero, I would have asked 20 other people. I'm just, so I, so the whole point is building resilience. So ask 20 people that can help you. And if you get 20 no's, there's 10 more or five more or two more or 50 more people you can ask. Don't stop asking because just because you don't have what you want doesn't mean it's not possible, which is why that's in my title of my book, the possibilities part. That's the most important part. It is possible. Hey, Unbroken Nation, we'll be right back to the show, but I wanted to let you know that you can grab a copy of my first book, Think Unbroken, Understanding and Overcoming Childhood Trauma, for free. If you go to book.thinkunbroken.com, you can download the PDF ebook version of the book and get everything that I know about the baseline of healing trauma for free downloaded to your email right now. Just go to book.thinkunbroken.com to download your copy of Think Unbroken, Understanding and Overcoming Childhood Trauma for a PDF for your phone. Again, that is book.thinkunbroken.com. Yeah. How do you step into possibility? Because I think that people as they go through this gets disillusioned, right? You hit, you hit no three times, eight times, 30 times over the course of four years, yeah. right? Five years, even like, I, I feel like people get so jaded by that. How, how do you continue to stay positive and in this place to, to seek possibility? So I think one of the ways is, um, I'm going to go back to Marie Broler because I learned this from her a couple of years ago. If you have this dream in your heart and other people have talked about this for, before, if you have the vision or the dream or the idea, it's because you're supposed to pursue it. It's a very simple concept. I, I wish I would have learned this when I was in my twenties. If you have the idea, the dream or the goal in your mind, you are supposed to pursue it. So, um, that right there opens your mind up to possibility. Like I just had an idea. I guess this means I'm supposed to go ask someone about it or read about it or look 
do whatever I need to do about something about it. And right there, that's your possibility. Um, and if you're wondering what else is possible, this it goes kind of goes back to the resilience piece, which is, um, I'd like to do this, whether it's a new job, travel, find a, a soulmate, whatever you, whatever you want to do, it's possible. And the reason you know it's possible is because other people are doing it. And if you don't see anyone else doing it, it still doesn't mean it's not possible. It just means no one else has done it yet. So look for examples of possibility. Um, ask yourself what else could be possible and, and look for other resources, but also, um, it just, it just went out of my mind, the possibility I had a good point. Um, almost anything that you can think of in your mind is possible. I know people will say like, okay, well, I want to be like Michael Jordan, but I'm 50 years old and I want to go in the NBA and I can and whatever. It's like, no, no, probably not. That's probably a good example of you not being able to do what you want to do, but that doesn't mean you can't go work for a basketball team. You can't go um, support a basketball team. You can't go volunteer for some, someone that else that does something with basketball. You could be, you know, you can go to school to learn how to talk about basketball and be a broadcaster. Like there's all these other avenues. Um, and then ask yourself like, okay, if I can't have that thing, what do I really want? Like when I get that thing, what's the feeling I want to have? And if the feeling I want to have is I love talking about basketball and playing it and being around people. Well, you don't not only need to be a player to do that. There's a lot of other ways to do that and stay in mouth basketball. So it's like, when I think of possibilities, it's like, what am I trying to achieve and why am I trying to achieve it? And just because you have the idea and you get a no, doesn't mean it can't happen. And your idea might just need to be tweaked a little bit because something else is possible for it. Does that help? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think about this journey all the time of like, chances are because there's freaking 8 billion people on planet earth huh? that somebody has done the thing that you want to do. And, and, and honestly, you know, it's funny. Cause I remember you've mentioned Marie for Leo a couple of times. I connected with her years ago and then I was in London actually when her last book came out and I was on the train reading it. And I was just thinking to myself, you know, it's crazy how different your life can be when you choose to show up for it. And, and I think a lot of that comes from like the execution against these dreams. But I, I worry that people will hear this and that people can be overly optimistic and overly positive and, and be very much in this manifestor mode, but not be taken action, mm. right? W where's that parlay between like manifestation and action and, and actually bringing these things to fruition? Yeah, so I actually have a chapter about manifesting in my book too. It's the last chapter of my book um, because I believe that, um, you are, um, your, you manifest what you desire. And if you can't manifest the thing you desire, it's because you're blocking it in some way that like, you think you want it, but you really, it's not happening because there's something, there's something you're doing to block it. It's not some, something someone else is doing. It might look like that, but it's something someone else is doing, but you're right. If you can't just say, I would like a brand new car to come to me, you know, as a gift or whatever. And like, I'm just going to sit back and just think about that all day long. Now, first of all, you can think about it and that will be helpful. How it's going to make you feel and what it looks like and, 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 and imagine all the details about it. But if you just sit back and take absolutely no action, um, and you don't start researching the car, you don't start looking at pictures of it. You don't start talking about people about how much you want it and how excited you're going to be when you get it someday. You're not building any momentum. You're not, um, you're not creating all of the, the good energy that goes uh, through and around that desire to have this new car or whatever. I'm just using that as an example. Um, it could be anything, but the whole point is if you just sit back and do nothing and only think about it, having it happen to you is a lot less likely than if you do all those other things I just mentioned, which is creating it. So it's been in it. I, I don't know how much you know about the whole manifestation thing. If you read a lot about it, I do, but there's a, it's all about creating the feeling inside of you. And when you have that, when you change the vibration and you change the feeling inside of you about having it, having it be yours, that's what ends up drawing it to you quicker. But if you are only thinking about the lack of it, that's when you keep pushing it away. Like I don't have that car yet. And I talked to you, Michael, about this new car and I, I really want this new car, but I don't have it yet. And, and I'd love it to be a gift. And I don't know anyone who has that kind of money. Well, all of those things I just said to you are not going to bring that car to me sooner. But if I say to you, I really have my eye on this beautiful car. I can't wait to get it someday. I have a feeling I'm going to get like win a prize or something. I don't, I don't know. I just, uh, and then we start talking about how exciting it could be that I have it. This is, it's not a, it's positive it stuff. It's, it's fun. It changes the way you feel. It makes you excited. And then it makes you want to go do the things that might 
make it possible. But if you're only talking about all the negative things, manifesting is, it doesn't, doesn't happen. That's not how it works. Hey, Unbroken Nation, we'll be right back to the show, but I wanted to let you know that you can grab a copy of my first book, Think Unbroken, Understanding and Overcoming Childhood Trauma for free. If you go to book.thinkunbroken.com, you can download the PDF ebook version of the book and get everything that I know about the baseline of healing trauma for free downloaded to your email right now. Just go to book.thinkunbroken.com to download your copy of Think Unbroken, Understanding and Overcoming Childhood Trauma for a PDF for your phone. Again, that is book.thinkunbroken.com. So I'd love for you to talk about where you feel the life is as a human race and species around hustle culture and this idea of like oh, surrender. Yeah. So, so let me read you a poem. I have a, I have a mentor, a uh, professor, Sri Kumar Rao. He teaches at Columbia London business school. He's a famous MBA professor. He's a teacher on mind Valley and he teaches these MBA classes and there's a long line to get in. But the reason his classes are so popular is because he takes American and British MBA students, and he teaches them the wisdom from ancient sages, Rumi, Sri Sri Maharshi, and other sages long dead who have messages that are relevant in today's world. And one day during a particularly stressful day, I happened to be in a business meeting with Sri Kumar and he paused me and he said, Vishen, may I read you a poem? And this is the poem he read me. And this poem is, uh, is, is from Rumi. I want to read it out to you because I think it may help give a different perspective to hustle culture. So Rumi says this, when I run after what I think I want, my days are a furnace of stress and anxiety. If I sit in my own place of patience, what I need flows to me and without pain. From this, I understand that what I want also wants me, is looking for me and attracting me. There is a great secret here for anyone who can grasp it. Let me repeat. When I run after what I think I want, my days are furnished of stress and anxiety. That's hustle culture. If I sit in my own place of patience, what I need flows to me and without pain. That is surrender. And we'll come to that in a moment. That is one of the most powerful tools for actually creating change. From this, I understand that what I want also wants me is looking for me and attracting me. There's a great secret here for anyone who can grasp it. So we're going to break this into three parts, right? The first part is basically a damnation of hustle culture. Hustle culture is one of the worst things about the United States. Mm. America is a country and I love America. I'm, I'm heading and going to spend the next one month in the U S don't get me wrong. I just got my, my equivalent of a U.S. residency. But for fuck's sake, America is a country based on a really awful algorithm that no longer should apply in the world. And it's the algorithm of GDP above anything else. Even the reason our education system is broken is because in the 1920s, I think it was Calvin Coolidge, the president who said, the role of education is to create cogs in the wheels of industry. It's all about output, output, output. And then somebody has to buy this output. And so you are told you're not enough unless you have those headphones. You're not enough till you have this extra pair of sneakers. You're not enough unless you have a, not one, but two cars and a house with a garage. And this is one of the things that leads to hustle culture. But if I'm now living in Europe and it's very different, Europeans work way less than Americans, significantly less. If you compare American worker productivity to German worker productivity, Germans get way more free time, they get way more maternity leave, they get way more holidays, they work less hours a week, but average worker productivity completely crushes Americans. If you look at healthcare, the average European lives two years longer than the average American. Hustle culture is a fucking disease, my friend, yeah. and it's ruining America. It's causing us to become sick, to become broken. It's causing us to create a consumerist culture that isn't good for the world. In the 1980s, the average American bought 12 new pieces of clothing a year. You know what it is today? 62. Now it's up to all of us to change this. We need to move companies towards a four and a half day work week. We need to stop this idea of celebrating 70 hour uh, work weeks. If you're a CEO, we do better 
when we give our body time to relax, when we give our people, our employees time to focus on their health and their well-being, we do better resonation when men and women have maternity and paternity leave that is 12 months to 18 months here in Estonia. So I, my former wife is Estonian. Um, we delivered our first baby, uh, here. Well, she delivered the baby. I, I basically watched, You're but <laughs> it's 18 months maternity leave. 18 months. I was a struggling entrepreneur back then. If we didn't have that 18 months maternity leave, it would have been really freaking tough. And the government basically helped pay for her salary because we, we, we needed two salaries to survive. And in America, it's two weeks. What the fuck is that? Yeah. If you're lucky. Now, as a result, Estonia, which is where I am right now, now has a higher concentration of entrepreneurs per capita than Silicon Valley. More VC money floating around per capita than Silicon Valley. We're the most technologically advanced nation in the world. And still you get 18 months paternity or maternity leave. You get you, it's rare for people to work more than 40 hours a week. People take four to six weeks vacation a year. All healthcare is paid for. It is, it's amazing. But What's in America, that? any of these changes are deemed socialism. Exactly. And, and Americans don't even fucking understand the word socialism. Yeah. You're, it, it, it's, it's, it's so crazy. You guys need what is happening over here in Europe because Americans are killing themselves yes. slowly by surely through stress and overwork uh, and yes. killing the planet. If everybody lived like Americans, we would need four and a half planet Earths to support our species. And I think there's really a lot of different ways that we can get in to talk about that. But w when you grow up and you're looking at the world and, and you understand possibility, I think it changes everything. How important yeah. is your view and what you focus on in this journey? It's, it's everything. And I'm still learning and still growing. Right. I, I recently passed, there's a milestone in my family from a financial aspect, but what I'm learning is, and this is something, again, you can all just date this stuff back to the, when you, when you really change the lens in which you view things with in life, it, it just becomes a whole new world, right? It's like, if you ever see someone just put on a new pair of glasses that actually help their eyes. It's like they're seeing everything completely different. So oftentimes when I was younger, I would see things that I wouldn't think attainable, right? But after seeing it and seeing it and seeing it, I said to myself, I'm going to do that one day. I can get there one day. And then you set your mind and you focus on those goals. But I think if you don't see it and if it's not really in your circle, or if it's just not something that you can visualize, or if, you, if it's not in your vision in a way that you can relate to, oftentimes it, it's a lot harder. But if you can, and this is why sometimes I may do things just to inspire people. Um, it, here's an example. Oftentimes I may, I have a Rolls Royce and I have a Maybach that I drive. But it's not so much because I love the drive of the of those cars. It's really to inspire people around me. I'm very in tune with the New York City neighborhood that I grew up in. And just to see the faces of the young guys, my, my kids play basketball. So when I go around their teammates and they see those things, I really want them to understand, hey, hey, I know someone that is successful. And now I feel like I can be successful. So I know someone who drives a Rolls Royce, a Maybach and all these other fancy sports because I'm a car fanatic, by the way. Right. And I do it oftentimes, not so much for me, but I know if I could be that for a younger person, I can change their life to say, Hey, you know, Caden's dad drives that car. I, I, I'm going to get one too, or it's super cool. And it's prom season. A lot of those guys, they rented cars, they borrowed them from me and they use it for their proms and things like that. And that is some, that is a, a way that I use to get back in the sense that I want you guys to know that you guys can achieve whatever you want. It's really having that mindset. Yeah. And, so, and yeah. I would guess, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I'd, I'd love for you to go into this. When I hear you say that, I think to myself, that car that mm -hmm. status as a symbol 
is just simply a marker of possibility, right? I don't know that that is the definition of success. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So for me, seeing things, and as I, the, the older I got, and the more I got around successful people, and the more I got around people whose mindset was very different or more advanced than mine, the more I believed I could do these things. So it's all about possibility. It's all about me showing kids and individuals in, in those neighborhoods that it's possible. And it's possible from someone that looks just like you, right? I came from where you guys are. I, I, I wanted to really touch on corporate social responsibility a little bit today. Just uh, that's a concept I learned where companies make it really big, right? And then they start to look back and say, hey, how can we're, we're, we're responsible to communities to give back and to show them that they too can grow. And, you know, it's a responsibility to get back to those communities and show that they can be successful as well and possibly build companies from a really, from a starting point to, you know, a large market company. Yeah. I, I actually love that we're about to broach this conversation because, mm -hmm. you know, many people who listen to the show know this, but I'll, I'll share it with you. At 20 years old, I landed a job with a Fortune 10 company. No nice. high school diploma, no college education. And and for me, it was like, okay, cool. I just, I just seen it, right? One of my friends had gotten a job working for a similar corporation. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, oh, if this guy can do it, I can do this too. And and my marker for it was like, this is the kid I used to get stoned with and skip school. Like if he can do it, All I right. can figure it out, right? And so I landed this job. I'm in corporate. I'm with this Fortune 10 company. I'm in it for a little bit over five years. During that time, I wasted pretty much the vast majority of that money. Let's be clear about that. But, <laughs> but, but I learned, I learned so much. And one of the things that made me never want to work for a corporation again, but instead go into entrepreneurship was the lack of responsibility that they had in giving back. And I remember right. we would just sit here. I would look at the sales numbers I would pull in and I would rack up, dude, $15 million in sales for these guys mm -hmm. in a year year and they would give nothing to our community wow. nothing yeah. to where we come from you know they would they would do the cancer run and shit like that but like everybody does it that's not right right responsibility to me so i would love for you to go into that because i think this matters in the conversation that we're having right now what, what is so, corporate responsibility and why is it actually important so it's and you're right in saying that because my first couple of jobs there was no such thing as corporate social responsibility Right. It's fairly a new term, but I think it comes from guys like you and I making it to those corporations and saying, Hey, we made X amount of money. What are we doing? Or the company I was with allowed you to give a, um, a grant to charities of your choice. And I was just saying, Hey, like $4,000, we're a billion dollar company. Is there anything else we can do? Right. So I, I dragged those companies out to events to basketball events and have them maybe change the rims in certain neighborhoods. I had a company, I don't know if I could say the name, but I had a company repay, uh, parks in the neighborhood that I grew up in. And it's, it's a, initially corporations weren't doing it right. And they weren't as involved, but now I'll say over the last 10 years, we see corporate social responsibility really taking charge. And I think it, it, it had to come from a place or guys like you and I to challenge these corporations to, to start to give back and do things in the community, um, in which their customers probably help them grow and get to the level that they're at. Yeah. Why is that important though? Cause I, I think that a lot of people, I would say probably the vast majority of people listening to the show are, are not entrepreneurs right. as is really right. most of the country. And I think people feel like they're too small to make that difference, that they will walk into boardrooms or they'll walk into meetings and they'll be dismissed. But I, I've come to find that's not necessarily the case. But yeah. why, do you, why do you think it's important for, for us to be socially responsible in this capacity? Because there are, there are changes that are needed in communities that they may not know about, right? So it's important for individuals like you and I 
and, and companies do have allotment for charity and things like that in a corporate social responsibility sector, right? It's important because the monies that they give, and it can also be time, right? So it's at any level, once you become an entrepreneur, you, you can control your time, your money and everything else of the business that you're in, but whatever we're, we're finding that giving back, going back to the communities in which you came from. Oftentimes we're finding that people can relate in certain areas. One of the things that I I'm seeing now is mental health. Corporations are really starting to put a strong focus on mental health There's mental health drives. I see, I think Kevin Love was probably one of the first NBA players to, to come out and say he had some issues with mental health. I think it raised awareness and with guys like you and I speaking up, let's just say Kevin Love, for example, raising that awareness, it's important because it could help so many other people, right? So it, whatever it is, wherever the corporations decide that they want to pitch in and help out, there's such a need for it in a, in a mental health space. I mean, I think we can change neighborhoods and try to try to decrease the level of violence that happens in certain neighborhoods. There's so many things that can change people's lives. And it's, it's just a matter of touching them and saying, Hey, you know, you don't have to go that route. There's stop the violence campaigns. There's so many different things that corporations can do and partake in that can really change kids' lives. A lot of the mental focus and the mindset that I gather and that I draw from was when I was a kid. Right. It started just at the very early age. And then again, the things we talked about earlier, the things that you see, right. And you see someone that says, Hey, I work at IBM American express or these large internet companies. And you, you start to understand that you can do it too. Again, we talk about the possibility. So it's important to be able to touch people. It's important to be able to share your story share those success, success stories with people that are less fortunate and really don't have that road navigated for them to show them that, hey, it's possible that you guys can get here as well. We'll be right back to the show, my friend, but I wanted to let you know about our brand new podcast community for Think Unbroken Podcast. I know that for so many trauma survivors like myself, for the longest time, I felt alone, like nobody got it, nobody understood, and that I was just going to have to figure this out on my own. But that's not true. And the reason why we created our brand new Think Unbroken Academy podcast community is so that we can bring all the members of the Unbroken Nation together in a place where we can learn, grow, heal, change, and transform our trauma into triumph. I would love to have you come and be a part of the brand new community. Just check out thinkunbrokenacademy.com or click the link in the podcast description. And I cannot wait to see you there, my friend. Again, just head over to thinkunbrokenacademy.com. And until then, be unbroken. Thank you so much for listening to Think Unbroken. Please share this episode with someone who could use it and help us move forward in our mission of ending generational trauma in our lifetime. And if you would, please take five seconds to pop on iTunes or Spotify, hit that five star, leave a review. And you can also reach out to us on social at Michael Unbroken or at Think Unbroken. And of course, you can check out our YouTube channel at Think Unbroken. Thank you for being a part of Unbroken Nation, my friends. And until next time, be unbroken.